There we go. Oh, so um, the message today um, comes from Romans. And uh, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, uh, those of you who don't identify in the Christian tradition uh, may just hear in this uh, everything you've always hated about the Christian tradition. Uh, come to think of it, uh, if you do identify Christian, it may be all you've hated about the tradition, too. Uh, for uh, Paul, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of the fire and brimstone stuff that the Apostle Paul comes up with. But nevertheless, I think he has something to say to all of us, maybe even particularly to those that I've heard do what I think is misinterpret the passage. So I'm going to have a little fun with it for a minute because it is kind of a fun passage to read if you're, you know, a dramatist like me. So let's see where this goes, beginning in the 18th verse of chapter 1 of Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. They are without excuse, for they knew God, but they did not honor God as God or give thanks to God. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human. Being, being birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Moving forward a little bit, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, their gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, and yet not only do they do them, but they applaud others who practice them. So, okay, Paul's trying to make a point here. And it's kind of interesting because, uh, of course, you know, Paul is imagining a cosmology where there's a God up there who is acting in very particular ways who's throwing down God's wrath, you know, lightning bolts from heaven, so to speak. And, you know, frankly, I just don't think that flies anymore. But I do think we see that dynamic. I think we see the things that Paul is talking about, because when people start to act along the lines of the myth of separation, that there's an other that they can control, or there's something that makes them right and somebody else wrong, when there's splits in our society, things do, in fact, come apart we feel what might feel like the wrath of God. Creation devolves. Take the original sin of this country, slavery. We are seeing what happens when people are acting outside of God's love and, and, uh, and desire for unity to be among the people, for there to be no separation among us. We're seeing it unfold right now. And we certainly see the dynamic unfold as nature itself is starting to fight back because we've been acting as though we're in control and separate from nature. The polarization that we see in our society, we're seeing it devolve and we're watching our communities fall apart. And so Paul is very clearly outlining a dynamic. He might say it's a God up there doing it, but that was his perspective. That was his worldview. We can see the dynamic nevertheless. And we should take it seriously. Because the reality is, when we meet those moments, when we are not acting in coherence with God's unity, and instead acting as though we are independent and wise, things do devolve. Of course, Paul has been talking about they for this part of the chapter. You know, they do this, they do that, they do the other thing. I just love it when he takes a turn in verse one of chapter two. Therefore, you have no excuse. Sorry to say that's you, me too, but you. 
Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are. When you judge others for in passing judgment on one another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. We know all those racists are bad. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things, and yet you do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Paul's pointing to all of us and saying, we all operate with the myth of separation to one degree or another. Now, we may do it in different ways. I, 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 I may not do the kinds of things that my Republican friends might do, but I do other things. I'm judgmental. I get angry. I mean, every time I read a Donald Trump tweet, I live it. You know? There's a sense in which, though, when we make the other bad and we judge them, cancel them, put them aside, that we are running into the very same problems that we would accuse somebody else of doing something with. It's less comfortable, but it's no less true. When the mirror is turned on our lives, and we can see the part that we play in the devolution of the society and the culture in which we live. That's just the way it is. But it's interesting. Now Paul gets to the heart of the matter, and I swear I have heard a hundred sermons on this passage, and I don't recall ever hearing a sermon that emphasized these, uh, these following verses, and they're the key to what Paul is talking about here. Do you despise the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Don't you realize that God's kindness is meant to lead to your repentance? Don't you realize it? Now, Paul is a Jewish theologian, so when he starts talking about forbearance and patience and kindness, you can bet he has the Hebrew word chesed in his mind. This is the way the Jews think of the nature of God's presence in the world. There's an orientation of loving kindness, of steadfastness, of compassion. This is what comes at us from the presence of God. So what Paul is seeing here is a balance. On the one hand, yes, there is something that feels like wrath when, when things are not filling out and unifying. Things do, in fact, fall apart. It's almost the way creation set up. But God's orientation is different than that. I remember years ago, I was preaching a, a children's sermon, and there was a, a little girl, four years old, named Angela. And uh, I had Angela... Uh, raise her fist in the air. And I said, yeah, okay, there we go. Four-year-old fist. That's the wrath of God. Okay. And then there was a, a guy who used to walk up with the kids for the children's sermon. His name is Paul Gavicki. Uh, he was a circuit, secret service agent who used to guard uh, the first George Bush. Six foot two, 220 pounds, strong, big. I said, okay, Paul, would you please put your hand over Angela's and this giant paw comes over and swallows up her little hand. That's the chesed of God. The orientation of the presence of God. That's what this is about. And the Apostle Paul is saying that it's that, it's that compassion that allows us to shift and change and repent. It is not judgment and annihilation and cancel culture that's going to get the job done. We saw just a little example of that over the last couple of weeks. Some of you may uh, be sports fans, some of you not. A guy named Drew Brees, who's a quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, very well-known quarterback. It doesn't really matter that he's a famous quarterback. He's just a public person. And so we saw him wrestle with something in public. And it struck me that repentance played a role and how it came about. A couple of years ago, um, during the Colin Kaepernick um, uh, protests, uh, Drew Brees spoke very strongly about never kneeling when the flag was, and when the national anthem was being played. And he doubled down on that in an interview last week. He said, I'll never agree with anybody disrespecting the flag of the United States of America, our country. 
let me just tell you that what I see or what I feel when the national anthem is played, that when I look at the flag of the United States, I envision my two grandfathers who fought for this country during World War II, one in the Army, one in the Marines, both risking their lives to protect our country and try to make a country and this world a better place. So every time I stand with my hand over my heart, looking at the flag, singing the national anthem, that's what I think about. And in many cases, that brings me to tears, thinking about all that has been sacrificed, not just those in the military, but for that matter, those throughout the civil rights movements of the 60s, and all that's been endured by so many people up to this point. And is everything right with our country now? No, it's not. We still have a long way to go, but I think what you do by standing there and showing respect to the flag with your hand over your heart, it shows unity. It shows that we are all in this together. We can all do better, that we are all part of the solution. Well, you can guess that he got a little blowback. And two days later, he apologized. And I don't think this is one of those apologies that came because, you know, he was bothered by criticism. It doesn't sound that way anyway. I would like to apologize to my friends, teammates, City of New Orleans, Black community, NFL community, and anyone I hurt with my comments yesterday. In speaking with some of you, it breaks my heart to know the pain I've caused in an attempt to talk about respect, unity, and solidarity centered around the American flag and the national anthem, I made comments that were insensitive, completely missed the mark on issues we are facing right now as a country. They lacked awareness and any, time of any type of compassion or empathy. Instead, those words have come to be divisive and hurtful and have misled people into believing that somehow I'm an enemy. This could not be further from the truth and it is not an accurate reflection of my heart or my character. Now, naturally, President Trump had to tweet and say, what a horrible mistake you made by going back on your apology, uh, by uh, apologizing for what you'd originally said. And then he said something that I just struck me. He responded to Trump, through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community, I realize this is not an issue about the American flag. It's never been. We can no longer use the flag to turn people away or distract them from the real issues that face our black communities. We did that back in 2017, and regretfully, I brought it back with my comments this week. We must stop talking about the flag and shift our attention to the real issues of systemic racial injustice, economic oppression, police brutality, and judicial and prison reform. The real key to that to me was the first sentence. Through my ongoing conversations with friends, teammates, and leaders in the black community. I wish I had a transcript of those phone calls and conversations. But even without one, I can guarantee you that they were painful, that anger was expressed, but there was not that final cut them off judgment. Because if there had been, it would have just turned into a screaming match. No, there was forbearance. There was patience. There was compassion. I would imagine, maybe I'm dreaming, but I would imagine that there was even an expression of appreciation for his original statement. Wrong though it may have been, but his original statement desiring a unity. That's how repentance and change takes place. That's the dynamic that the Apostle Paul is calling us to. Forbearance, patience, compassion, kind of care for the other that calls us all into being a new society. Every week, Barbara and I begin this gathering together by saying there's only one way to change. You have to know what's going on in your life, and you have to do that in the context of compassion. And we mean divine compassion, forbearance, care, and love. That's the center of what Paul is trying to get across in Romans. 
that we need to rely on that chesed, rely on that care, and we need to express it because it's true for you and it's true for everyone else in this society. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge for us. It is awfully easy for me to hang out with like-minded people and get furious at those people that just don't get it. Who don't seem to understand that uh, the Republicans are tearing our world apart. You and I need to pay some attention to why it is that people feel the way they feel. Express some patience, forbearance, and compassion for their situation, for their feelings, because it's the only way you end up in conversations that will actually change this world. It's the way we brace our feet against the rock of ages, that gorgeous chesed energy, and swing this unwilling world around. It's not a popular passage, and I skipped the verses about homosexuality that really would have driven you nuts. But you know, he's on to something. The center of what he was saying is a challenge to you and a challenge to me. That when we're talking to friends and that, you know, that kind of anger and frustration comes out, well, that, that's okay. But then let's encourage each other to take a step back and ask, why is this happening? What's going on in somebody else's life that they would be taking the stands and making the decisions that they're making? Because with that kind of forbearance and patience and kindness and compassion, this world will begin to change.